book is written just to, to reflect on it. It's written in bite-sized pieces. You know, you talked about the 185 topics there. There's a topic per page and it's just meant to help moms. And by the way, I was given a number of books during my divorce. They were so thick, so dense. I would open them and I would close them. I never read one of them. I, I couldn't, I couldn't take all of that information in. So when I went through the process of deciding to share this guidance, I decided to share it in these bite-sized pieces. So if you are a mom going through divorce, you can open it and you can read a page. That's maybe that's all you can take in that day, you know, and you can put it away. And it's broken into preparing for the change during the change and post the change, because there's very different things you need to think about. And it's not meant to be read cover to cover because to take all of that in when you're going through divorce is too much. You know, there's just too much. There's too many logistics to think about. There's too many emotions that you're dealing with. So it really is meant to kind of be there for when you need it. Um, and this process, it is one of the more significant processes you'll probably go through as an adult and in guiding your children through it as well. Welcome back to the Empowered Woman, Badass and Unfiltered podcast. So I just want to talk to you about the fact that empowerment takes many forms. But for my guest today, Sarah Armstrong, a good divorce proponent, VP of Global Marketing Operations at Google, and author of The Mom's Guide to a Good Divorce, learning how to use your compartmentalization, your compartmentalizational muscle um, will take you far in getting what you want, keeping a positive mindset, and making sure you and your children, well, making sure your children take priority. For self-care, the, the compartmentalization muscle is, is essential. We're talking about that. We've got the links to her book and everything else below. Um, I'm just so excited to get into this because for one, um, I think that that muscle is just needed in so many aspects of your life. So yeah, let's... Uh, how, what, what brought you here? And yeah. I will say this, she's got 185 different topics in her book about divorce. So yeah, let's. Lots, lots to talk about. <laughs> Great <laughs> to be with you, Olivia. You know, yeah, what brought me here? You know, it's, um, it's interesting because I never actually expected to write a book and especially on the topic of divorce. You know, I, my, my, I come from a family where my parents have been married for 54 years. Mm -hmm. you know, and they were the model of, you know, our true partnership. And, and sometimes things don't kind of turn out as, as planned. And so, um, but what's interesting is, um, in the journey I've gone on with this book and, and we'll talk a lot about building a compartmentalization muscle, you know, it's, it started with a reflection on the fact that if I was going to go through this change in my life, that wasn't planned, mm -hmm. that I wanted to go through it in a certain way that really kept my daughter grace as the focus and making sure that um, her life, although it was a decision my ex-husband and I made to, to go through divorce, that her life would not be negatively impacted for the long term just because, because we decided to make this decision. You know, and that was really fundamental. Would you say that when you get divorced and you've got children, because I know we've we talked about this before, you mentioned how like if you are married and you don't have children and you get divorced, it's more of a breakup. Yes. But when you got other lives involved, yes, it's you really have to. I mean, in this case, put your children first. Yes, absolutely. And the thing is, when couples get married, you know, they first of all, I always say um, a couple of important things. And and I should start by one thing: I'm not an advocate for divorce. Mm -hmm. I actually think couples should get married and stay married for the long term. That's that's why you you get married. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. And these days, it's more common than ever. So I say that there's three important points to keep in mind when it comes to, to divorce that no one gets married to get divorced, mm -hmm. right? No one gets divorced for positive reasons, generally, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And but children don't get to make a decision of whether their parents are going to get a divorce, but their lives are the most negatively impacted by that decision if you're not careful. So when you think about um, where society is and the concept of divorce is not enough good conversation about how to do it well and how to have a good divorce. You know, there's all those mental models of the divorces that we have maybe all seen either growing up or in our, you know, in our friend group or whatever the case is. And so my goal is really to help society think about a divorce in a different way. And, and could we actually have people understand that if you're going to have to go through a divorce, 
that a good divorce is possible and it's attainable outcome. And when you talk about couples that get married, you know, when they have children, you know, they've made a commitment to their children to raise them in the healthiest, happiest environment possible. I mean, that's, you bring your children, I, I joke that you put bike elements on them and you feed them organic milk. You do all these things, you cover the plugs, mm -hmm. like all these things to make sure that they're, you know, they're healthy and happy. And unfortunately, when you go through divorce, there's a toxicity that can come into your world and your children's world, right? And it can have a long-term impact, Olivia, on a children's approach to relationships, their view on marriage, and their overall happiness in life. And so there's a huge responsibility when you become parents and, um, and you bring children in this world, and then for whatever reason you decide no longer to be together, you're still co-parenting mm -hmm. those children together. And you have to take that seriously, that that's a commitment you've made to those children, that they should be able to grow up in that healthy, happy environment, regardless of whether they're living in two homes. Absolutely. I mean, I was thinking about this before we, we spoke about a friend of mine who her, her parents, I don't know if they were married, but they had three children together and then they separated. And you know, they hear the, the stories that kids tell each other Yes. are so different like for what is everybody's always so somebody's evil you know yes. somebody's so bad yes and then you feel that tarnishes your relationship with that parent yes absolutely and so and that's and that was I and mean, you go again because you know divorces are so common these days you can have families where there's this fractured environment of, of children either not having a healthy relationship with one parent because of what's happened and i think again because you know there's again there are situations where one of the parents may maybe shouldn't be in the picture right and and i'm you know that that can be the case and if that's the case then maybe that's what needs to happen but where it is a situation where there's a potential of having a healthy relationship with both parents it's up to the parents going through that divorce to create the opportunity for that to actually be the case for those children. It's not up to the kids to do that, but it's up to the parents and how we handle all the day-to-day -day dynamics that come with raising children and thinking about how we're doing that. And it takes, I will say, it takes effort. This isn't, what, what we're gonna talk about is not an easy thing. Um, and building a compartmentalization muscle is not an easy thing, you know, but it is doable. And if you want what's best for your children, I think it's worth putting that focus and effort into it so that your children can end up not telling their stories later on in life to a therapist, right? About what their parents did when they were five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, whatever the age is that the divorce occurred. Absolutely. And you know, this, this is bringing about thoughts of my parents' divorce, actually. So mm -hmm. my parents divorced when I was eight years old okay. and um, they chose to live in the same house again when I was 16 to co-parent because we needed it. Um, okay. There were three of us. Mm -hmm. And the reason my parents divorced was because my father ha had a drug addiction. Okay. And so, you know, that, and I, I feel now as an adult, I feel like I knew entirely too much about what was going on. Interesting. I, I, I just personally, as an eight-year-old, I knew yeah. too much. Um, right. Yeah. But, um, and then I found out my father, my parents were very, very open with me. <laughs> and as I was a teenager, my dad was very open about mm -hmm. just the way he was like, the, the, he loved to live a party lifestyle, like the infidelity my mom put up with. Like, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have never put up with that stuff either. Like right. he just, he just loved to have a good time. Right. And I'm yeah. just airing out my dear, my dirty laundry, but anyway, oh, yeah, it was just, I, I still, the fact that they chose to love us so much to put their differences aside, mm -hmm. to live in the same household, to make sure, and it was only for two years, but to make mm -hmm. sure they made a positive impact on our lives. Um, yeah. Of course, my father was clean at this time. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that really did positively impact us. And I, I absolutely believe that that compartmentalization muscle did come into part with this because you yeah. got to put some stuff aside as an, as an adult, you, you got to learn how to handle those emotions. Absolutely. And that is, I think, oh gosh, and what you've just shared is so powerful because your parents obviously made a very conscious choice, first of all, to put you as their children first, which is so fundamental, but I'm sure there's moments where your mom, and I, I don't know her, but you know, she, she probably had to put a pretty strong compartmentalization muscle, you know, in place over the years, both with what she was dealing with. And then at, at those stages, what I would say is interesting is in a divorce situation, there are so many emotions, right? Mm -hmm. And so 
and, and you need to feel those emotions to purely internalize them and to bury them is also not healthy. You know, I do believe that, you know, a lot of our health issues could be linked to, you know, stresses we internalize versus letting out, but there's times to allow those emotions to be out and to be shown. And there's times when they probably need to be compartmentalized. And to your point about what you share with your children, you know, I don't think depending on the age, but most children are not probably prepared or, or should be exposed to all of the emotions that you're feeling at that time. So if you're feeling them, like then go for a walk or, you know, remove yourself from the situation where your children are going to experience those emotions with you if you can, and because it's not healthy for them. And then, you know, there's other times where you literally need to put them aside, <laughs> you know, put them, put them inside and get through that moment, whatever that moment is. It may be a moment where you're, you know, I, I say there's moments in life where you need to be there for your children as parents, maybe sitting next to each other at a soccer game. And so when they look up, they see both their parents or going to a parent teacher conference or whatever the situation is. Um, so you might have to put some emotions about that other person you wouldn't choose to spend time with because you've chosen no longer to be married, but for your child, for the children's sake, being in places at certain times for them and letting those emotions not show is really important. I, um, you have a very high stress. I'm, I'm just assuming your job is high stress. <laughs> I'm just going to assume. <laughs> you know what? It's funny. I love what I do and it, I don't feel it's stressful, but some people would reflect that maybe it might be stressful. I, I, I have a, a high, probably have a high tolerance for a, an intense um, schedule is what I would say. Yes. <laughs> I always, I admire that most are among badass women, uh, women that, that are making the world go round, women that are in high level positions. I admire how well they handle what would seem to me outside looking in like extremely stressful email. Yeah. Hell is, yeah. is stress. Okay. <laughs> like what's yeah. not, I understand. I understand. So, yeah. While you're going through yeah. your day to day at yeah. work, going yeah. through the divorce, yeah. dealing with children. How did that compartmentalization muscle really come into play? No, it's a great question. Um, you know, a couple of ways. First of all, I think that when, um, when you're trying to do the, what I call the working mom's uh, juggling act, which it truly is. And then when you become, in fairness, as you're going through the process of divorce, becoming a single working mom, which is a whole nother model that some, you know, you don't necessarily think you're signing up for that when you get married and, and have children. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, what I really tried to do is when I was with Grace, you know, when I had the time with Grace, I was fully present with her. And I literally had, I mentally compartmentalized work out. I was like, this is her time. She didn't get many hours of the day with me because I was working. And so that was her time. And even on my calendar, in fairness, I literally blocked it. It said Grace time. You know, so in the evenings, that was her time and I really protected it. Then when I was work, when I was at work, I was as focused as I could be. And when I needed to deliver, knowing that, yes, I was Grace's mom. And if the school called and I needed to go get her because she was sick, we do that. But I really tried to um, keep the two separate, but, but linked. And I think the interesting thing is during a divorce, though, when your personal life does require more time in the day to day of maybe your working hours, how you do that. And so. One of the things I really had to um, recognize is I had to treat it like a project, you know, and kind of tackle it and say, okay, what are the steps that are required to do this in the way that we were talking about doing it? Um, the other thing is in fairness, even just from a career standpoint, I passed up a promotion during the time I was getting a divorce because I just couldn't handle that next layer of learning that would come with that new role and those new expectations. And I literally, they said, we'd love for you to take this role. And I said, now is not the time. <laughs> and it, in fairness, Olivia, at the time that that was offered to me, I didn't explain why. And the person who had offered this to me came back and they're like, I just don't understand. I don't understand why you don't want to take this role on. And then, and then I had to explain why. And that was fine. I just wasn't, I wasn't broadcasting in the workplace that I was going through this process. And to your point about compartmentalization, I only shared with a few people in work that this was going on. I wasn't, you know, uh, airing all of this um, in my, in my day-to-day -day work. And so when I finally explained it to them, they looked at me and said, okay, I got it. And I said, you know, I, pre again, I appreciate the vote of confidence and I'd love to do this role at some point, but now is not the time. So what I got from that is in divorce, there are multiple levels of sacrifice. 
And I think that, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily come like, because for one, you didn't know that this opportunity was going to come up no, while no. you was going through this. No, you know? not <laughs> like, at all. This is life. No. Life happens yeah, Exactly. Things happen. Things and, happen. And so it's like, so you're dealing with different levels of emotion, just different levels of emotion. Yes. You know, yes. when you're a career driven female, but also a mother and a wife that's going through a divorce, I can mm-hmm. only imagine how devastating that was to you to be like, I would love to take this opportunity, but I can't right now because my, this is taking priority, even uh, though it's, it's the crumbling of something. Right. Right. Yeah. And then things, yeah, you, you feel like part of, part of your world is falling. It feels like it's falling apart right? When you go through divorce, like things are kind of crumbling around you. But what I needed to be clear on is what did I need to do to be able to maintain, quite honestly, Grace's life in the most stable form possible through this process. And I thought if I take in another challenge at work, then that's less time for her and the time she probably needed me most. And also just from a well-being standpoint, it takes extra energy to manage, you know, quite honestly, undoing your life in many ways and we and then rewiring your life so you're you're taking pieces apart and you're saying okay what does this next stage of my life look like and how do I you know ensure I mean in our instance we were Grace and I were going to stay in the home that we were living in but as we went through I, I talk about minimizing the gaps just physical of the physical environment your children and like when you take a, a piece of art off the wall you know what are you putting up there you know in its place versus just the, the mm. physical representation of things being pulled apart You know, and so those were the types of things that um, I really was putting my whatever little extra energy (laughs) I had at that point, I was putting into ensuring that Grace was not feeling the physical or the emotional impact of what we were doing to her life. And uh, it it was it was a very conscious effort. It did take planning and, um, you know, moments where I'll I'll tell you a crazy story, but it it does just really um, kind of show what I'm talking about. There was a, we had a long family wall, black and white photos. That was my ex-husband's family and my family. It was all interspersed on this wall. And I, through the divorce process, I obviously wanted to give my ex-husband his family photos. So I went to the effort of having other photos framed and I sent Grace down the street for a play date because um, she was seven when we got divorced. And I you know, took all the pictures down and put others up and got it all set. She came home an hour or so later and I was in the kitchen. And she says, hey, mommy. And I go, and I go, what's that, Grace? She said, the wall has changed. And I stopped in my tracks. And I said, well, what's changed? She said, there are more pictures of me up there. It looks great. And she ran up to her room. And Olivia, I can tell you that if I had not taken the time to reframe other photos and put them up there, and I just left the little hooks, right, for where my ex-husband's family photos were, and just left those there until I got around to it, what Grace would remember is coming in the house during her parents' divorce and my mom taking all of my dad's family photos off the wall and leaving those little hooks up there. And she'd be telling a therapist that 20 years later, right? That this is what my, <laughs> this is what my, this is what happened. So I, that's where, you know, yes, I passed up the promotion, but I was taking the time to figure out how those moments could be avoided where Grace would feel like things were just being pulled apart. There's so many levels of thought that goes into this. And I think that's just another um, component to why your book is so necessary because it's not just helping the woman going through the divorce or the the man that's going through the divorce. It's helping the child. And and it's at some point ending generational curses, because let's say you don't have a house, an example of what a good marriage is. So you like, you've already seen how, how easy it is to give up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I I do think there's, you know, and and my book is written just to to reflect on it. It's written in bite-sized pieces. You know, you talked about the 185 topics there. There's a topic per page and it's just meant to help moms. And by the way, I was given a number of books during my divorce. They were so thick, so dense. I would open them and I would close them. I never read one of them. I, I couldn't, I couldn't take all of that information in. So when I went through the process of deciding to share this guidance, I decided to share it in these bite-sized pieces. So if you are a mom going through divorce, you can open it and you can read a page. That's maybe that's all you can take in that day, you know, and you can put it away. And it's broken into preparing for the change during the change and post the change, because there's very different things you need to think about. And it's not meant to be read cover to cover because to take all of that in when you're going through divorce is too much. 
You know, there's just too much, there's too many logistics to think about. There's too many emotions that you're dealing with. So it really is meant to kind of be there for when you need it. Um, and this process, it is one of the more significant processes you'll probably go through as an adult and in guiding your children through it as well. I also, I like the fact that you mentioned, you didn't say it verbatim like this, but not being a chatty Cathy, not telling everybody your business. I think that's a character trait that a lot of people need to develop. Um, <laughs> just in general, everybody yeah. doesn't need to know what you're going through. No, you know, and they don't. I mean, I think you choose, right? You need a support network. You need to mm -hmm. share with those where you need that support. But you need to decide what's what's that circle of friends or family or coworkers that are going to be there for you through this process because you do need that support. But not everyone needs to know. You know, I, I literally, it's it's just one of those things where do they all need to know that this is happening? I just chose not to. I mean, it's, it is a choice to your point. And and I'm 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 ironically I'm a very private person, which is a bit of irony that I've written a book about divorce and told <laughs> told told snippets of what happened to us. But I'm actually a very private person. Um, and so, but it was. It was a choice of who we told and who we didn't. And my ex-husband and I actually talked about who we were going to share the news with so that it, you know, we could, um, you know, share appropriately um, and as needed. Yeah, I'm, even though I do a lot of stuff online, I'm very private as well because we can control what we share. Yes. And I think people have to be mindful that we don't owe the world an explanation for every single thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I find it so interesting how, like, I want to know the process of you actually writing this book. Yeah. Um, Cause I just, I find it so interesting. Yeah, no, it's an interesting, well, it's, it's an interesting story because I can start from, you know, the beginning of first, as I mentioned, I never intended to write a book. I don't consider myself a writer. Ironically, I write bullet, I, I write business bullet points very well, <laughs> but that's, that's my form of writing. But what happened is when I got divorced, I was the first of my friends to go through the process. And over the course of about five years, I had a number of friends that would come to me and they'd say, you know, would you help me? I, I'm at the stage and I'm trying to think through things. Would you help me share, share with me what you did because you did it so well. And so I helped uh, uh, about four of my close friends over the course of about five years. And I'm at the end of each of those um, processes. They'd say, you really need to write this stuff down that you've told me. And I'd look at them and I'd say, oh yeah, I'm like, you know, someday, but I'm thinking to myself, I'm never going to do that. And so I was actually at a business dinner in Latin America with a group of Latin men and my colleagues and they're great guys. And one of them turned to me and he looked at me and goes, Sarah, you're so happy. And I said, yeah, I said, but you're divorced. And I said, I said, <laughs> okay, I, said so I said, Selman, um, yes, I'm divorced. I go, but getting a divorce is not a death sentence. I said, my, I'm happy. My ex-husband's happy. Grace is happy. I said, you know, you can be happy and be divorced. And I explained to him that I'd been helping my friends through their divorces and that they were encouraging me to write a book. And he said, well, you really should. So the next morning I got on the flight that I was uh, flying out of Mexico City and I opened my laptop and uh, I started writing. The first line that I wrote was, this book is written by a girl who never, ever thought she would get a divorce who got a divorce and what she learned along the way. And I wrote over the course of about a year plus on Delta, actually, ironically, about 80 to 90% of my book was written on Delta because I travel globally for my, for my job. And so after I'd finished my work on these long flights, instead of watching a movie or, you know, reading a book, I'd open my personal laptop and start clicking away on, you know, the, the advice that I'd been giving. So that's kind of, and then my friends that were the ones I helped through became contributors because I'd go back to them and say, so is this what I told you? And we would compare notes. And so there were um, four of them that really became contributors to the book. Um, and then the interesting thing, the title actually came from Grace. And um, we were at a CVS uh, a year after our divorce. So she was eight and we're standing in line and there's a People magazine on the newsstand and there was a, a celebrity couple getting a divorce. And she looks at it and she goes, mommy, is that a good divorce or a bad divorce? And I said, Grace, I don't know. I go, what's the difference between a good divorce and a bad divorce? She goes, well, a good divorce is when the mommy and daddy are nice to each other like you and daddy. And a bad divorce is when they scream and yell at each other. And so Olivia, I walked out of the CVS that day and I thought, you know what, whatever we're doing, my ex-husband and I had made some conscious choices along the way in that first year. I said, whatever we're doing, the fact that my eight-year-old, who has literally just had her world, you know, pulled apart in many ways, could call it a good divorce was something that I didn't take lightly. And so when I was thinking about what to, to actually title the book, 
that's how we came up with the mom's guide to a good divorce. I, this is just so cool for when I, I prefer Delta as well. Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan, of, <laughs> big fan of Delta. Big fan of Delta, yes. <laughs> I'm one of their top flyers, in fact. So they, yeah, they're, I've, I've spun with them for many, many years, 30 years, yeah. Um, yeah. But also the fact that your, your daughter, and because children, they do know a lot and they yes. pick up on so much. And the fact that they that she can say, you know, Grace said, mommy, you had a good divorce. Yeah. You don't yell at each other. Right. What? It's like, yeah. yeah, but that was going back a little bit goes back to her comment about the compartmentalization muscle, right. And the emotions that my ex-husband and I would share with her versus what we would, you know, reflect on ourselves or with others. So it just, it was, those are all conscious choices we made. They really were because the emotions were there. I, you know, they're, it's, it's a high emotion situation, right. but you know, but that's that I felt that the fact that she could take away a year in that that's where we were. I thought, okay, we're, we're on a path. And I didn't know, by the way, at that point, obviously I wasn't planning to write a book and do all these things, but I knew we were on a path that that's, if she could perceive it that way at that stage, then I'm like, okay, let's, let's keep going with what we're doing. Um, and then the other really interesting, you know, story that still sticks with me is when she was in sixth grade. So five years later, we went to her parent teacher conference and it's one that she sits in. So it's my ex-husband and myself and Grace with her teacher. And in an hour and we're about done with the conference, end of the conference. And the teacher looks at us, she goes, wait a minute, are, are you two divorced? And I stopped, I said, well, yeah, we've been divorced for five years since Grace was in first grade. She said, I had no idea. And <laughs> I looked at her and said, well, it never occurred to me to tell you <laughs> that we're divorced. I mean, it wouldn't be like, hi, we're divorced. Can we now have Grace's parent teacher conference? So she said, you would be amazed at how few couples that are divorced can come into this office and sit here for an hour and talk about their children's education. They're not capable of doing it. She goes, it makes me so sad. And by the way, Grace is hearing this whole conversation. And I just, I looked at her teacher, I said, that makes me really sad too, because what's more important than parents of a child coming in and talking about how their how their child's doing in school you know and she goes you just would realize how rare it is and that's the thing Olivia that's what I'd like to change it shouldn't be that rare it should not be that rare that we can set those emotions aside for the hour needed and go sit in here how our kids are doing in school right you know there's so many people that are like, you know, divorce is so bad, blah, 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 all this about divorce, but we cannot ignore the facts. People are getting divorced yeah. at an increasing rate. Yes. There are children involved in this and you are here with your book as a solution to helping something that is already taking place. This absolutely. is not something that, and it's, and it's not against marriage. I absolutely, no, no. you are here. This yeah. is the thing. Yes. Like, yes. And that's why I say I'm not, I always say I'm not an advocate for divorce. I, I love to see people happily married. It makes me so happy. And, and, you know, what's really crazy is when I just had someone write to me yesterday saying, I just gave one of my colleagues your book. And I always have this like pit in my stomach, like, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. They need it. You know, because it makes me very sad to know that they're having to enter into this process. But to your point, my, my book is just meant to be there just kind of as that thing that helps you along the way. And, you know, right after I wrote it, going back to the story of writing it, I did a, a book signing at Barnes and Noble. And um, I had a woman a couple months later stop me in, in the grocery store in the produce section. <laughs> and uh, she said, are you Sarah Armstrong, the author? And I had to stop because I, I don't, again, I, this whole being an author was a new concept for me. I said, oh, actually I am. And she said, well, I was at your book signing at Barnes and Noble. And I just want to thank you for writing this book. I'm going through a divorce and I carry it around with me and it keeps me calm. Mm. And she said, so thank you. And she walked away and I stood in the middle of the produce section as this woman walked away. And I thought, that's why I wrote this book to help a woman that I've never met before. That's going through a really challenging time in life. And if it's going to help keep her calm, I'm, you know, that, that it just was just such a, a moment for me to say, you know, this was, you know, the, the journey I'd been on was, it was for a reason. What are some of the um, coping skills 
for when you are compartmentalizing, but you're dealing with those emotions. It's time to handle those emotions. <laughs> what are some of your suggestions for handling those emotions? Yeah. So first of all, I'm a big believer in walking. And I know that sounds really funny, but I think I coped with a lot of my emotions by putting on my running shoes and getting outside and just walking. And I walked a lot. <laughs> I walked my neighborhood a lot and over those years. And I think that's one of the things that just giving yourself some time and space to process, you know, without anyone around. And whether you listen to music, you listen to podcasts, you just listen to your own thoughts and feelings, just giving yourself that space. Um, the other thing that I um, felt was important to do at the time is uh, figure out the times when I was giving. So the concept of volunteering and giving back in these moments, it sounds crazy because you have so many things going on, but putting yourself in a situation where you see that there's others that have much more challenging situations in life and you are so fortunate was perspective building for me always in those moments when I might be feeling emotion. Like, let's go put, <laughs> kind of put this all in perspective. And so I tried to volunteer when I could because it really helped to, to you know, reset myself relative to some of those emotions. And the other thing is um, I love to travel. And so I would put things out there that I could look forward to that because again, the emotion, there's a roller coaster of emotions you go through during a divorce, but having something to look forward to. And by the way, it may not have to be a big trip. It could be, you know, seeing a friend that lives an hour outside of town, but it's just having some points in time in the future that you have to look forward to, I think helps when you're going through some of those emotional highs and lows, and I'd say the lows specifically, um, because they are there and you need to recognize that you have to work through them, but it also helps to know you have something, something out there in the future to look forward to. And then the final piece, sorry, is self-care overall, mm -hmm. which is, I, I, I joke and I say this, um, going through divorce is like kind of going through pregnancy. You need your sleep, you need to eat well. <laughs> um, you need to, you know, because you need the energy to both feel, deal with the physical and emotional impact that this process is gonna have on you. And so taking care of yourself is really important during these times. And that's usually the thing as women, Olivia, that we put last, mm -hmm. you know, during these really challenging times and we stop working out and we stop eating well and we stop doing these things. And I think, that then contributes to some of those emotions taking hold even in a stronger way than maybe they should. And you're in, you have a harder time with your compartmentalization muscle. Cause I'll, you know, you're, you're weakened by the fact that you're hungry, tired, and, and, you know, not feeling like yourself. Thank you. I, I love to walk. I will say that <laughs> I'm, so I'm one of those people. I love to get out to nature. Great. And I don't plan on getting divorced. I was telling, no. I was telling so many people, I was so excited about recording this one. I was oh. telling people, I was like, you know, if, you know, I'm talking about having a good divorce and, you know, I don't plan on it, but if I need no. to, you know, one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, know that's like, right. You're so funny. Well, you know, it's funny because in writing this book and, and this topic, you know, divorce is, divorce is a taboo topic in society. I mean, it really is. I mean, there's such a stigma with this topic. And I realized that in even writing the book and even talking about the fact that I've written this book, I, you know, I have had people that are skeptical when they hear the title, right? A good divorce. Um, they are a little resident to even want to talk about it because it seems like, oh, if I talk about it, it seems like I'm embracing, you know, support of the concept of divorce. And I always just say, look, divorce is not meant to be a scarlet letter. You know, it is an action. A couple has decided to no longer be together. And yes, it is a, a huge decision, and especially when children are involved. But it shouldn't hold the stigma that it does in society because to your point, so many are going through it. And if that's the case, how can we allow society to understand that those couples that are going through it are going to be okay in the long term if they can handle it in a certain way and that their kids are gonna be okay in the long term if they can handle it in a certain way. And that's, that is exactly why I've written this book and why I enjoy talking to you about this topic because. I just think there's just this stigma that we need to, to shift. I think a lot of people care entirely too much about what other people think. And then they get into their lives and then they want to ignore the fact that they're going through a real big thing because it shouldn't, they shouldn't talk about it because that's what society says. And then they just end up in an even worse hole, you know, and, I, and as you're speaking about this, 
not only does it help the children, but it also helps you in future relationships. Absolutely. Because if you have a good divorce, you understand you do the self-healing, the self-work that you need to do. Yes. You, you can be more reflective. You have a lot less anger and resentment that you're holding against somebody yes. because you're, you're going through the, I'm, I'm sure like granted, I haven't read the book, but I'm, I'm going to get it because it's like, yeah. it, and just to suggest to other people as well, because yeah. I know so many people, I mean, I got married well, I'll be married for seven years in October. Congrats. That's awesome. Thank you. The majority of people that um, got married around the same time that I did have already gotten divorced. They're already on their second marriages, like around my same age group. Wow. And um, I, I just, I, I feel like how this would be extremely helpful because we can't ignore reality. No, no, we can't. We, and unfortunately, I don't think divorces are going to go away, you know? But, but if they're going to, if they're here, then there's, I, I just fundamentally believe there's a way to handle them. Um, and I also think, you know, coming out of the last two years and all that's gone on with what I call the unexpected togetherness <laughs> that we've had as families and as couples, I unfortunately think that, you know, this is, this has been a tough couple of years for many couples. And I think we're, we may see more of an uptick in shifts taking place because I think there's a lot of reevaluation going on in society these days, by the way, on every level, you know, for relationships, careers, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it is interesting how um, pervasive it is. And so I just think that's why I'd love to see us um, potentially handle, enter in the conversation at a different point with a different kind of lens of if you, if you've come to the place where you can't be happy together, then how can you be happy apart? I love that. You should, I, if, have you done a TED talk yet? I have not, but it's actually, on. Uh, it's, it's my, it's one of my goals. I'd love to yeah. get to the TED women's conference is what I'm, what I'd love to get to, to really talk about this. It's, it's really a goal. Cause I think that that would be a, an, um, a great platform to, to share this message. Cause I'm just, I'm, I met a TEDx speaker last night. I've had a few on the yeah. podcast mm -hmm. and um, it's one of my goals as well. It's like, they're yeah. on my vision board. <laughs> so I'm just looking over at it and I'm just like, man, like, cause I've listened to so many and I know that you have as well. Yeah. And it's just, yeah. this is a topic that really needs to be on a TED space stage. I, I would agree. I would agree a little bit. I'm, I'm working, I'm, it's, it's in the, it's in my, to your point, it's on my vision as well. I, I've not yet cracked it, but I'm working at it. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I, Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. Mm -hmm. I, I greatly appreciate you and the value that you add to the show, to people, to the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, it was just an honor to have this conversation with you. And again, guys, her links are in the show notes below. Well, thank you, Olivia, for having me, having me really enjoyed our discussion and I appreciate you putting a focus on this topic. So really um, enjoyed it. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Empowered Woman Badass and Unfiltered Podcast. If you found any value in this, please consider sharing and subscribing. Now go out and be a badass.